VIC-20 computers are notorious for having bad composite video signal. So today, we're going to turn this into this, and all of that without making any permanent modifications. Hello and welcome back to Knowledge Retro Lab. The VIC-20 is a system that fascinates me. I never used one back in the 80s, and I'm much more familiar with the Commodore 64, but there's something about the simplicity and the historical significance of the VIC-20 that really attracts me. I've had this VIC-20 PAL in my collection, and I remember it had some problems with the quality of the image it puts out, but I never stopped to really fix it. So in today's episode, let's have a look at it and make sure that the video signal looks as good as possible. Let's start by actually seeing what the problems are with the image. I started capturing the image directly from the composite signal on the VIC-20, but the results are really washed out compared to what I see on the TV. That might be a sign that something is wrong with the signal, or maybe it's just my capture device that doesn't like it for some reason. We'll come back to that at the end. So I switched to recording on the TV screen directly from my camera, and at least it's very close to what I'm seeing. The basic prompt looks okay, but there's a very distracting pixel pattern along the left edge of the screen, and all the letters have a light border to them. It's as if it's being sharpened by a modern TV, but this old CRT doesn't have any sharpening modes. So there's something about the signal that's not right. On games, it's even worse. Look at the letters at the top. It's as if there are extra pixels in between the letters, making it really difficult to read. And in game, it's more of the same. Those letters on top are pretty much unreadable. Then I tried another cartridge I have, GORF, and things got even worse. What's going on with the spaceship? And what's that enemy up there? That's not just some pixels out of place. It looks completely wrong. And this other screen also just things are totally wrong. It's like we're missing half the pixels, or like the data is interpreted in monochrome mode, except that we're seeing multiple colors on the screen, so it's not just that. This is pretty weird. And to have another data point, I tried DigDug, and I got this. Apparently, getting the screen in a small square in the corner is normal. That's what we get for a rushed PAL port. But just like with GORF, it looks like the characters are missing a lot of pixels. Just to be sure, I looked online and this is what DigDug really should look like. So yeah, Houston, we have a problem here. All right, let's open up the VIC-20 and see what we find inside. Since this is the first time I'm covering the VIC-20 in this channel, let's have a quick overview of the board just to get oriented. So first of all, this is the VIC-20 CR or cost reduced version. You can tell because it's a shallower board than some of the early ones. And if you're familiar with Commodore 64 boards, you'll feel right at home in here. All the way to the right, we have the CPU. It's a 6502 running at 1.1 megahertz in the case of a PAL system like this one, or just one megahertz for an NTSC one. Next to it, we have two ROMs, the kernel ROM and the basic ROM. And a little further away, we have the character ROM. The two big chips on the left are VIAs, which take care of the I.O. lines. It's very similar layout and function to the CIAs on the C64. And underneath is the biggest difference with the C64. That's the RAM right there. Those are HM6116 static RAM chips. Each of them has 2 kilobytes of RAM with a full 8-bit output for a total of 4 kilobytes of RAM. But wait, didn't the VIC-20 have 5 kilobytes of RAM? That's right. See those three smaller chips over there? Those are 2114 static RAM chips. Each of them has 1024 times 4 bits. So between the three of them, they have one and a half kilobytes. Something's still not matching there. It turns out that one kilobyte is mapped to the general system RAM and half a kilobyte, specifically 1024 nibbles of four bits are used for the graphics memory. And finally, smack in the middle is the VIC chip which takes care of graphics and the sound as well. On the Commodore 64, it will be replaced with the VIC-2, which just dealt with graphics and the dedicated SID chip would deal with the sound. So first things first, let's see the video quality on this particular TV here in my workbench, since this is where we're going to be adjusting things. And yeah, I can see that it's just as bad. It has all that, all those pixels on the side. The VIC chip has two adjustable components nearby. And looking at the schematics, it looks like one of them adjusts the clock signal. So I expect it will have some effect over the color encoding usually. So let's try it. Oh, so the colors go away. Let's 
not really making any difference yeah yeah that doesn't seem to make any difference at all and the other one should control the voltage of the composite video output signal so really we should see a difference in brightness um, as long as transistor q2 is biased correctly yeah that gets brighter and the other way it gets darker So that actually looks better, but I think it might be a side effect of the LCD. Let's try that on a CRT TV to be sure. So as I suspected, we're still seeing that pattern in there. And if I adjust it here on the CRT monitor, it just gets darker. So there isn't really a jump where that goes away. So I think that was an artifact of the LCD, like it gets past a certain brightness and it just smooths that out. I still like it brighter than it was before. I mean, before it was, before it was like this. So it's definitely a lot nicer, something like that. So let's have a look at the video signal out of the VIC chip. So pins two and three have the color in one and luminance and sync in the other. Okay, that looks like the color. And then on the other one, we should have the luminance and the sync. There we go. Yep, that's, that's exactly right. And that's even probably the blue border and then the white tech or the white background of the screen and then the blue border and then new frame starting there. And then that little noise that you see there sometimes, that is probably the fonts, is the, is the text that we see on the screen that's probably ready because it's right there. So yeah, you can kind of see slices of the screen on the oscilloscope. And then a lot of this circuitry here, what it does is it combines those two signals into a composite signal, which is really those two signals that we just saw combined together. And so what we have here is just the combination of the color signal and the sync and luminance and all of that. And this might be the color burst. Let's try to zoom in a little bit. So that might be the color burst before the beginning of the frame. So yeah, I mean, just visually, everything seems fine. It's not like it's missing any color information. I mean, obviously it couldn't because we were seeing color. I don't have a good way to look with the oscilloscope to see if that color information encoded there is matching the luminance exactly. That's, um, so they could be slightly off. They are probably slightly off. That's why we're getting those patterns, but that's not something we can easily just see with the oscilloscope. At this point, I did some research on the VIC-20 graphics modes just to see if I could figure out what was going on with games like Gorf and Dig Dug. And that's when I found out about the multicolor mode from the excellent VIC-20 programmer's reference guide. The VIC-20 starts up in what's called the high resolution graphics mode. The screen is 176 by 184 pixels. In that mode, characters are eight pixels by eight pixels. So we have 22 columns and 23 rows. And all of the bits in each character can either be the background color or the color for the character. However, since having each character be just two colors is very limiting, and the VIC-20 doesn't have a true bitmap graphics mode, it does provide another mode called multicolor mode that is used in many games to provide more colorful graphics. In multicolor mode, each character has half the horizontal resolution, so it's 4x8, but each pixel can be up to four different colors. I have a feeling the problem we're seeing in Gorf and Dig Dug was related to that graphics mode. By the way, all of this is really well explained in the VIC-20 Programmer's Reference Guide. I love the technical details and amount of information they included. It even has a full circuit diagram for the computer in the back. They don't make them like this anymore. So let's see if the problem is with the multicolor graphics. In order to switch multicolor graphics, I need to type poke646 10. So what we should see is that each pixel in a character can be of different colors and the character itself is going to look a little chunkier because it's going to be lower resolution. Oh, very interesting. So this confirms that the problem is with the multicolor graphics. We should have gotten this ready, it should have been a mix of red and blue and probably something else. And instead it's purely red. That tells us that probably, unfortunately, unless there's something else, the VIC chip itself, the chip in charge of generating the graphics, is faulty or semi-faulty. 
And then I read that control seven returns to the normal mode. There you go. Okay. Yeah, so that would explain why games like Gorf looked so horrible, because they were making their graphics as a mix of characters with multiple colors. To test that theory, we're going to swap out the Vic chip. It's nice that it comes socketed. And here I have another one from another Vic 20. It doesn't mind us borrowing it too much because it's currently non-functional, so it's one that I'll have to fix in a future episode. Okay, let's see if that one makes a difference. Ooh, it looks much worse, much, much, much blurrier. At least on the LCD, but I'm not as concerned about the LCD because that's not my final platform to use it. And let's try that again. Poke 64610. There we go. So that one does the correct thing. At least that means that now the graphics chip is doing the correct thing. Let's see what GORF looks like. Right, so at least we have the shape of a ship. Now, I'm really not liking at all those um, gaps in between the, the pixels. And... But this is better than it was before. Yeah, I mean, at least you can make sense out of the game now. And just so that I can know for sure if the graphics are supposed to be that way or not, I got a third Vic chip from a, another Vic 20 donor that is currently not working. Okay, interesting. So this one, the letters look a lot better and the border looks a lot better, much more like the first one. So maybe I have two slightly defective Vic chips. That's a bummer. And what about multicolor mode in this one? Yeah, that looks good. So this might be the best one of all of them. I didn't realize there were so many variations and this one for sure looks the best of the lot. Now that we have a correctly working Vic chip and those games look much better, let's turn our attention back to the general video quality and see if there's something we can do to improve it. To start with, let's have a closer look at the circuit that generates the composite video signal. So looking at the video circuit here, it looks like somebody was here before me. Uh, definitely see some mods, like for example, there's this capacitor labeled capacitor 13, but instead of going into the one of the leads going into that hole, it's actually going all the way over there to the next to the variable resistor that we use for adjusting the intensity level. But then once I saw the back, then I realized like, okay, definitely somebody was here. We have a capacitor stuck in the back and then two really ugly looking resistors um, in there. Actually, after looking at the boards of the other donor VIG-20s, which all came from different sources, they have some very similar circuits to this one. They both have a component assembled diagonally, although it's a resistor instead of a capacitor, and they also have one capacitor soldered in the back. So I'm going to guess that those parts were assembled that way at the factory. All right, so for now, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave this capacitor and I'm going to leave the lead change, since that seems to be probably standard from the factory but I'm going to get rid of those two resistors and see if there's any changes. And also at the same time, I'm going to get rid of this annoying um, metal piece around it. It just makes it really hard to get to the Vic chip and everything else, and we're not gonna need it. Once we're done, we're going to place a heat sink on top of the Vic chip, so let's do that. Much better like this. Now we can really see what's going on and we can get to the chip nice and easy there. Let's go ahead and try it and see if the video quality looks any different. And no, it looks exactly the same as before. Well, at least now we have it closer to a standard system, so it makes it easier to use as a starting point for any further modifications. To have some basis for comparison, I wanted to have a few more images to compare any improvements. So apart from the basic screen, which we saw earlier, I also use this color test program, which is great because it detects weird interactions between colors in those vertical colored bars. This kind of video quality is something very common in VIG-20s, both PAL and NTSC alike, so it's not something specific to this particular one. One very common way to improve the video quality is to make a small mod to the video circuit and generate an S-video signal instead of a composite signal. We already saw that the VIC graphics chip generates two signals, luminance and sync on one pin and chrome or color information on the other. To get a composite signal, you need to combine the two, which is what all the circuit is accomplishing. But to generate an S-video signal, 
you just need to keep them separate. This allows displays to interpret the signals more accurately and get better image quality. That sounds like a no-brainer, right? In theory, that sounds like a good approach. But unfortunately, I don't have any displays that accept S-Video signals. The only way I may be able to use it is with this cheap adapter that takes S-Video, but I suspect that internally it just combines the two signals into a composite signal, so we may not gain much from it. Ideally, I would much prefer to find a solution that uses composite video, which can still have a really high quality image. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make the first part of the S-Video mod, but actually combine the chrominance signal with the luminance signal at the very end. The normal S-Video mod involves removing the chrome signal from being combined with the luminance, and instead just have it go through a capacitor and a resistor directly into the S-Video cable. So I've done exactly that, but then instead of having the chrome signal being separate in its own cable, it gets combined back into the composite signal. So there it is. It looks like a horrible contraption, but it's all just temporary for testing, so don't worry about that. And this is what it looks like. The pixel patterns aren't there anymore, but it's rather fuzzy and it has green and blue ghosting all around, so this is not really an improvement. So let's try the full S-Video mod and see if that improves things. So I want to try getting S-Video signal out of this, but in the least destructive way possible. So first, I'm just going to solder a few things just to make sure that it works and that is the quality that we want. And so I have this cable here. This is an S-Video cable. So this is all a mess of the uh, components halfway sticking up, but that's just for testing. Actually, this is really useful for testing. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect the ground to anywhere in ground, like you know, right there. The color information will be at the end of the resistor because the capacitor goes to the resistor and then it doesn't go through the rest of the luminance signal. And the luminance signal, I'm going to reuse this white cable that I had before. It looks really ugly, but that way we can see if it works or not. And then we'll worry about whether we need to break some tracks. And yeah, that looks better. I'm actually surprised it looks this good because I'm pretty sure that my Sony CRT TV doesn't support S video natively because it's pretty old. And I figured that it's combining just the two signals and displaying the composite, but however it does it, it's pretty good. It's still not perfect though. And you can see there's a lot of edges around some of the color bars. And the same thing in the game, it's as if everything has a dark edge surrounding it, but it's certainly better than my previous attempt and way better than the original video quality. And this is when things got interesting. I was turning the S-Video mod on and off, trying different ways to reconstruct the composite signal, when I accidentally left a capacitor connected I didn't mean to, and this happened. And that looks great. So after experimenting with it and trying a few variations, I came up with this final modification that creates really good quality composite signal. It has just three steps and it's completely reversible. There's nothing destructive about it. Number one, put in the capacitor C13 back in the place where it's supposed to go, and that's usually 220 picofarads. Number two is swapping the ferrite bead FB7 for a 0.1 microfarad capacitor, and the last step is connecting a 470 nanofarad capacitor from pin two of the VIC chip, which is the chroma signal, directly to the composite signal out. And that's it. And with that, this is what it looks like. It looks really good for a composite signal. There's definitely some ghosting going on in there, but in a way, it looks better than the S-Video, at least than the S-Video looked in my TV, so that's pretty amazing. The test color that we were using earlier also looks really good. Notice there aren't any weird dark edges like we got with the S-Video, and the color boundaries are actually really sharp. So why do those changes make the signal better? I wish I had a neat little answer for you. <laughs> Connecting the 470 nanofarad capacitor to the end gives the chrominance signal a high frequency path to the end, which may help with some of the distortion of the combining circuit. The other changes, I tried them a few ways and those just looked better in the monitors that I was using. So I'm afraid I don't have a more satisfying answer. 
So yeah, I would definitely recommend this mod on a PAL VIG-20 CR at least, especially since it's completely reversible. If someone tries it, let me know how it works for you. And also if you decide to try this on the non-CR board or even an NTSC, I don't know if it would make any sense there, definitely let me know. And as a final touch, so it lasts for a long time, I'm gonna put a heat sink on the VIC chip because it gets pretty hot. First, I thought I would use this kind of uh, heat sink because it's, um, it's the full size one but it just takes over a little bit. And with so many components nearby, I mean, I know that some of them are coated, but I'd rather not push my luck. And instead what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use two smaller ones and I'm going to overlap them in the center of the chip. This is where the most of the heat is coming from. So I'm hoping that putting them something like that will you know, effectively make it so it's one large heat sink. For completeness, and since I was right there, here's how the S-Video mod looked on my LCD screen. And yeah, that doesn't look very good at all. I don't know if the LCD doesn't like the S-Video, or it's the way it's combining it, but that looks greenish and not very good at all. And here's the final composite mod, which still doesn't look great, but it looks much better than the S-Video for some reason. Oh, I also tried doing a direct video capture again. Remember that I had problems with it at the beginning, and the colors are very strong. So. That was probably just the intensity level tweak, but it's good to know that I can capture video that looks good again because I will be doing future VIG-20 content. And to wrap it up, let's check out some of the games that I had tried at the beginning. In case it's not obvious, check out the before and after of Raid on Fort Knox. And that's not even a game that used the broken multicolor mode. This is just the regular high resolution text mode, but with the composite video signal fixed. And as a final bonus, check out this amazing high res graphic on the VIG-20. It looks incredible. And I wish I actually had tried that before making the video mod to have as a comparison, but just like this, it looks great. As you can imagine, to display this on a VIG-20, it uses all sorts of tech magical things. So if you're into that kind of thing, check out the link to the VIG-20 denial form that I put in the description. They have whole threads about this and other similar projects. There is also where I got the information about the standard S-Video mod and actually lots and lots of other information about VIG-20. So it's definitely a very worthwhile place to check out. The VIG-20 image is looking really good and I'm really happy with it but I think it's still possible to make it look better. After all, the Commodore 64 has really good composite video out with very similar initial graphic signals, so why can't the VIG-20 have it too? Anyway, that will be the topic for a future video probably. Also, I need to repair those donor VIG-20s that we use today, so this is just the beginning of several videos about the VIG-20s that I will be making over the next several months. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you have any comments, let me know as usual. And I do read them all, even if I can't respond to all of them. And I will see you next time. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Noel's Retro Lab on Patreon or joining the membership on YouTube. Not only is that the best way to support this channel and allow me to continue making more videos, but you also get some extra perks like early access, ad-free videos, and more. Thank you again to all the supporters. See you next time.